I, I want to thank all of you once again for bringing me back again for uh, to participate in your uh, Vaishnava uh, Culture Festival. Um, I think it probably started with the affectionate heart uh, of uh, Maya Chandra, who got to know me actually when I was at my first attempts at weaning myself from home. Now, the very first time I went to Odarya, Mayapur was there. We were a very, there are only four of us there, I think. Mayapur Chandra, um, Guru Nishta, maybe somebody else. Pardon? No, Chittahari was in Costa Rica. Trying to remember who else was there. And because I was old, I did the deity worship and cooked, and they were working on the interior of the temple. This was in the middle of the winter. Um, and I had never been that far north in the winter in my life. Um, I'm from southern places. And um, and I don't think I've been away from home for that for, for that long, for a very long time. And uh, so they saw that uh, Mayapur saw me at my worst. And his kind, I think his kind heart is part of, of why I'm here. And also, I know somehow or other Namrasana and Krishna Karnam and, uh, and Neela <laughs> took a liking to me when we met at Madhuvan, and I naturally to them, spontaneously, <coughs> and we, um, we actually very easily shared our hearts uh, with each other. We were, shared some very confidential things with each other, um, even though we had just met, and uh, it was very wonderful. And, um, and apparently I haven't, very, I haven't offended very many of the other devotees in the Polish Sangha yet. So here I am again this year, and I hope, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you'll be kind enough to bring me back again, because as I said the other day, this is um, one of the big highlights of, of my year, because I get to spend a week away from the rest of the world. Of course, now, this time, we have internet again. So we're not as isolated as we were last year. Last year, I thought was kind of nice. I thought, of course, no internet. It's a retreat center. <laughs> we're in retreat. <laughs> it's not bad. It's a little inconvenient for Swami, because he has projects going on. But um, So mostly cut off, uh, mostly out here in the country together, family, like a family reunion. And um, it's very, and this year you, you let me cook. Um, and you let me cook halibut, one of my favorite things to cook. Um, Halaba was delicious. Thank you. Very kind of you. Um, so, as I mentioned yesterday, what I want to do today kind of builds on what I spoke, of, what, what I read and, and spoke about yesterday. This is all connected. And what, you're, what you um, see is a work very much in progress. You're watching me think through something that when I discovered it um, made me very excited. And I looked for ways to um, explore the idea, to make sure that I, um, to make sure that I wasn't mm, too excited about something that maybe I shouldn't be that excited about. And as I explored, I thought, I, I found that, oh, this is really cool. 
This is really cool. And I hope you agree with me. Um, as you kind of uh, walk with me through my thinking, um, through this, um, this process. The, and and as, I, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we'll also go back and take a look at some verses that, we, that I spoke about last year from the 14th chapter of the um, 11th canto, the Uttava Gita. And, um, but we'll look at them from a different angle of vision, uh, a different perspective with something different in mind, as you'll see um, when I share with you what sparked this, what got this whole thing going. So I'll start with a verse and purport from Srimad Bhagavatam. This is Srila Prabhupada's translation and, um, and his purport. And I have, um, this has been one of my favorite verses and purports, um, probably since 1970, since I first read it. And then I'll share with you something that made it even, um, even more special for me, maybe, 35 years or so ago. Is this slipping? Is, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't want to break anything. Um, that is my that is my tendency. So this is um, Canto 1, Chapter 5. This is Vyasa, oh, this is Narada Muni speaking to Vyasadeva. As we know about this chapter, Vyasadeva is despondent, he's, dis he's depressed. He's done so much service, amazing service, compiled um, all the Vedas and the Puranas and, and the Itihasas, Mahabharat, um, for the benefit of, of all humanity, but he still feels dissatisfied. He feels as though he's done nothing of real substance. He feels as though what he's done is superficial and not really ultimately helpful for humanity. So he's, he's depressed, Narada Muni comes and Narada Muni says, well, of course you're depressed. You've done all this wonderful service, but you've really missed the point. Somehow or other, you've, you haven't given them a literature that, ex, that glorifies exclusive devotion to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The original, Swayam Bhagavan Krishna, the original Personality of Godhead. And you know, we know from this chapter, he says, all other literatures, anything that doesn't do this is like a place of pilgrimage for who? Anybody remember? Crows. crows, right? And what is the crow's place of pilgrimage? Garbage dump, <clears throat> right? I remember being in Calcutta, Kolkata, in 1980. And you wake up in the morning, in Brindavan, you wake up in the morning, you hear peacocks and monkeys and bird, all kinds of birds, at least back then. Nowadays, you probably hear cars. Um, but back in, in the early 80s, when I last went to India, uh, in Vrindavan, you would hear peacocks and, and uh, parrots and all kinds of birds and monkeys chattering. Um, in Kolkata, you heard crows first thing in the morning because they like uh, carrion, they like dead bodies, and they like garbage. So a place of pilgrimage for crows means a garbage dump, or I guess in our modern language we politely call them landfills. Um, but it's a dump. It's where all the garbage is cast. <clears throat> so he, um, a couple of verses back, Narada Muni tells, uh, he makes the point to, um, to Srila Vyasadeva that even if somebody engages 
in performing their duties perfectly, but they don't engage in devotional service. It's essentially, it's a waste of time. They haven't really done anything that benefits them um, substantially. And now in verse 19, he says this, he says, Navai jano jatu katanchana rajain mukunda sevyan vayadam grisam sutim smaran mukundang ryupakuhanam punar vihatu mitchen narasokra graho janaha. I'm going to focus, end up, I'm going to come back and focus especially on this last narasagraho janaha, this phrase rasagraha. You'll see. So Srila Prabhupada's translation. My dear Vyas, even though a devotee of Lord Krishna sometimes falls down, somehow or other, he certainly does not undergo material existence like others, the fruit of workers, etc., because a person who has once relished the taste of the lotus feet of the Lord can do nothing but remember that ecstasy again and again. This is a huge point. This, this makes a huge point about the power of pure bhakti. If you once, he says, if you've once relished the taste of the lotus feet of the Lord, you can do nothing but remember that ecstasy again and again. Okay, so that sounds like we're setting a high bar. But just wait. We'll put a, a, a bookmark there and we'll come back to that. Srila Prabhupada's purport, which I find quite wonderful and, and, and I'll um, share with you um, why I found it even more wonderful about 30 years ago. Srila Prabhupada says, A devotee of the Lord automatically becomes uninterested in the enchantment of, the, of material existence because he, he is rasagraha or one who has tasted the sweetness of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. There are certainly many instances where devotees of the Lord have fallen down due to uncongenial association, just like fruit of workers who are always prone to degradation. But even though he falls down, a devotee is never to be considered the same as a fallen karmi. A karmi suffers the result of his own fruitive reactions, whereas a devotee is reformed by chastisement directed by the Lord himself. We're going to come back to this, because I'm going to take a look at Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this verse. And Srila Prabhupada right here, he's just simply paraphrasing the comments that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur makes in his tika, in his commentary on this verse. Especially once we are initiated, the suffering and enjoyment that we uh, experience, it's not karma. Why? Because we heard yesterday, at the time of initiation, Bhakti enters the senses and mind of that devotee fully, well, begins to, you know, really take hold. And um, we no longer have a material body. Now, it's not a purely spiritual body. It's a sadhaka's body, a sadhaka deha. So it's a spiritualized body. And the example is given that uh, of uh, taking an iron rod and putting it into fire. Once it's in, if it's in, if it's in the fire long enough, it no longer acts like iron. Well, you can still hit somebody with it and give them a, a goose bump on their head or a bruise on their arm or something like that. But something else will happen. You can start a fire with it. You can burn things, burn holes in things with that. It acts like fire. So our senses, our mind and senses become spiritualized once we come in contact with Bhakti Devi. She and Krishna enters <coughs> our mind and senses through her influence. And <coughs> what did we read yesterday? From Jiva Goswami, and I'm going to come back to that again today. From Jiva Goswami's Bhakti Sandarbha, there's <coughs> a statement in. Atara Shruti. Let 
that, <clears throat> that bhakti makes us see the Lord, bhakti makes us aware of the Lord, bhakti puts us in the presence of the Lord. Bhakti controls the Lord. She is the most powerful thing of all. So when bhakti enters the devotee's mind and senses, she spiritualizes them. And with those spiritualized mind and senses, we're able to render devotional service. It's, ma it's like magic. It really is. In many ways. So, um, in the Karmi, he says, the devotee uh, is reformed by chastisement directed by the Lord himself. The sufferings of an orphan and the sufferings of the beloved child of a king are not one and the same. An orphan is really poor because he has no one to take care of him. But a beloved son of a rich man, although he appears to be on the same level as an orphan, is always under the vigilance of his capable father. A devotee of the Lord due to wrong association. That's a nice example, isn't it? I think it's a nice metaphor. If someone is, a, you have a, a lost, a ch homeless child, parents have died and the kid is left on the streets. Um, as happens too much um, in so many places in the world, um, that's a, a pitiable situation it breaks our hearts they they have they, they put these pictures of these children on television and, and on the internet i guess nowadays in, in appeals for uh, uh, uh donations to help you know build funds to help you know homeless children or starving children in different parts of the world we see these pictures and our hearts break and we you know get out our phones and we send a text for ten dollars to you know whatever is four five three one oh or something like that and um so it, you know but perhaps you have an adventurous prince and he wants to go try life on the streets or nowadays we have this phenomenon and probably it's the same in europe we have this phenomenon of of kids who run away from home and, and maybe even nice homes. They run away from home. They end up on the streets in the cities and they end up um, being victimized by sex traffickers. Horrible. It's, I mean, I, you hear about it and you just think, it, it, makes you, it makes you start to think about all the kinds of suffering there are in this world. And you think, oh my God, I can't even think about this stuff. It's overwhelming if we actually start thinking about it. And, and that's just the suffering of the human beings. When we think about the suffering of all the other creatures and, and, and it just kind of um, blows our circuits. We, you know, makes it hard to function. So maybe this adventurous prince decides to try life on the streets and he's thinking, it's really cool. I'm a street urchin, you know. I'm living here on the streets, I'm a tough guy. Never mind, there's a couple of uh, secret service guys always keeping an eye on him. Because the king doesn't want his kid out, you know, really out there. He doesn't want him being victimized by the sex traffickers. And he knows if anybody gets too close to him, you know, you've got the guys with the uh, little ear things and the sunglasses and strapped to the max uh, are gonna move in and grab the kid and take him home. And we know about, you know, the prodigal son, the, uh, the, the uh, story of uh, Jesus' story of the prodigal son in, in the Bible. How happy the king was to have him back, that the other son, who was a good boy, was all upset. Oh man, you're having this big sacrifice and big feast for the, the bum kid who ran away and lived on the streets for a while, went out and, you know, he was maybe, who knows what he was doing, maybe he was robbing people on the roads or something. And I've been a good boy all these years, and you're just kind of ignoring me. You don't understand. It's just really cool when somebody comes back. So, Srila Prabhupada says, the fruit of workers want to lord it over the material world. Similarly, a neophyte devotee foolishly thinks of accumulating some material power in exchange for devotional service. Such foolish devotees are sometimes put into difficulty by the Lord himself. 
As a special favor, he may remove all material paraphernalia. By such action, a bewildered devotee is forsaken by all friends and relatives, and so he comes to his senses again by the mercy of the Lord and is set right to execute his devotional service. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is also said that such fallen devotees are given a chance to take birth in a family of highly qualified brahmanas or in a rich mercantile family. A devotee in such a position is not as fortunate as one who is chastised by the Lord and put into a position seemingly of helplessness. That's an amazing statement. If someone, if someone, because of bad association, um, or as Vish we'll see, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, weak determ poor determination becomes distracted from the pursuit of pure bhakti. They may, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, take uh, birth in a pious family or a wealthy family, which gives them a nice opportunity um, to pick up spiritual life again. But if they're more fortunate, in the very lifetime where they stray, they get thrown into the gutter on the chance that it may bring them back to their senses and they pick up their service again. And I have seen that in many of my god brothers who become distracted and god sisters who become distracted and um, lived very strange lives for a while uh, when they moved away from the association of devotees and, when, and they come back and they are so appreciative they're so appreciative of the opportunity for devotional service. They, they have, a, a, as I was talking about yesterday, a clearer perspective on just how fortunate we are. We're so lucky. Uti Bhagya. Very, so fortunate. Um, the devotee who becomes helpless by the will of the Lord is more fortunate than those who are born in good families. The fallen devotees born in a good family may forget the lotus feet of the Lord because they are less fortunate, but the devotee who is put in, into a forlorn condition is more fortunate because he swiftly returns to the lotus feet of the Lord, thinking himself helpless all around. Pure devotional service, Srila Prabhupada says, is so spiritually relishable that a devotee becomes automatically uninterested in material enjoyment. That is the sign of perfection in progressive devotional service. A pure devotee constant, continuously remembers the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna and does not forget him even for a moment, not even in exchange for all the opulence of the three worlds. Now, this is a wonderful, encouraging verse, and the purport is even more encouraging. And Srila Prabhupada says that even when you have difficult, so much difficulty that you become completely distracted from your practice and maybe drawn away from the association of devotees altogether. No problem, you'll be back because you've had a taste. Oh, but I'm just a neophyte. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. But you've had a taste and we'll see why when we look at Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's. Now, this, um, this purport was highlighted for me by a friend of mine who uh, maybe 35 years ago, prob this was probably the very early 80s, he was a GBC member, he was a leader in ISKCON, he was the GBC for Hawaii, and um, some devotees were complaining about some other leaders <coughs> who had left ISKCON at the time. This devotee, who had, subsequently left for decades and then has since come back to the association of devotees. Um, some devotees showed up at his doorstep, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, just showed up at his doorstep. His wife answered the door and there's a couple of devo Hare Krishna devotees standing at the door and they want to talk to her husband. She didn't, I don't think she knew that he'd been a devotee for, <laughs> that he was a leader in the Krishna consciousness movement. Um, and so he's come back and he's 
I've been quite humble. So um, these devotees were complaining about a couple of the, the leaders who had left and was referring to them as ex-devotees or former devotees or something like that. So we're sitting there in, this, in the room and this sannyasi says to me, Babru, can you bring me Srimad Bhagavatam volume one? He says, get down Srimad Bhagavatam volume one, please. So I got the book and he said, please open it to chapter five, verse 19. I opened it up and he says, can you read the verse and the purport, please? I read the verse and the purport and we're all sitting there and he looks around at us and he says, there's no such thing as an ex-devotee. There's no such thing as a former devotee. And, and he starts naming these devotees that they were complaining about. He says, Karindar is not an ex-devotee. Guru Kripa is not a former devotee. He says, you have to see it from the right perspective. And I'm sitting there thinking, because I had some misgivings about this man. And I thought, well, there's something going on in his heart that I might not have estimated before. And I was able to give him a lot more... Um, uh, I, I, it really raised my estimation of him in, in my, in my, uh, from my perspective. Uh, I thought it was a really, a really wonderful thing. And I, don't, I already really loved this verse in purport, and he just made me like him even more. Okay, so there's that. However, um, some time ago, um, as these things became more readily available, um, I got a copy of the uh, commentaries of uh, Bishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, translated by my godbrother Banu Swami. And I read Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this verse, and I found it, if possible, even more amazing. And I hope you'll see why. So here's what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says. Well, I'll read Banu Swami's translation of the verse, a little different from Shiva Prabhupada's but essentially the same. The person, oh, the person who serves Mukunda will never, under any condition, return to the material world, unlike practitioners of other processes. Now, this takes us back to what we were talking about yesterday. Bhakti, uh, bhakti has effects that are impossible in other processes. Jnana, yoga, uh, karma, nothing. It's just not possible. Anyway, we'll see. We'll, be, we'll see because we'll go back to those verses in, in the 11th canto. Remembering the embrace of the Lord's lotus feet, eager for the taste that he has experienced, he will not desire to give up those feet again. And Vishwanath explains. <clears throat> this verse elaborates the point that there is no misfortune for the devotee. Boom. Powerful statement. That's, I mean, just, just that right there. Oh my gosh, what do you mean? But I've had so many problems. Even if overcome because of poor determination, Prabhupada says uh, uh, bad association. Vishwanath says poor determination. Even if overcome because of poor determination, the person who, who, who serves Mukunda never returns to samsara. Because that's what we mean about when we talk about going back to the material world. We talk about returning to the cycle of birth and rebirth. Birth, death, birth, death. Um, never returns to samsara, the place for enjoying the results of karma. Whereas those practicing karma do return. This is because he does not experience happiness and distress from karmas, since he experiences only the fruit of happiness and distress given by the Lord. What? He realizes he's making a bold statement, so he thinks, well, I have to support this with some evidence from the scriptures. When Prabhupada it talks about um, austerity of speech in the uh, 17th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He says, uh, 
Austerity of speech, one of the uh, items of auster austerity of speech means always citing scripture. Prophet says while speaking in spirit, when speaking in spiritual circles, it's required that we uh, uh, support our assertions uh, with evidence um, from relevant scriptures. So um, he cites a line from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 87. This is prayers by the personified Shruti, prayers by the personified Vedas, the Srila Prabhupada. Anybody read, ever read that chapter, prayers by the personified Vedas? It's a task, isn't it? It is, but it's amazing. It's something that you have to read a few times, slowly. And as I said the other day, take notes, make charts, you know, you know, I mean, if, if we were to give a seminar on prayers by the personified Vedas, we would probably need to use PowerPoint or Prezi or something like that, you know, to, just to kind of help us wrap our, because there's so much going on there. I remember that in 1970 or 71, whenever the second uh, volume of the Krishna book came out, and we, and we studied prayers by the personified Vedas in, in the Krishna book, it was... Um, I think we supplanted evening Bhagavad Gita classes with that because our temple president, Gursundar, who's a very intellectual and, uh, kind of man, um, said, oh, this will, everyone will understand the philosophy if they even try to get through these chapters. So this is a line from Prayers by the Personified Vedas. Tvad uh, avagami naveti bhavaruta shubhashaya. Shubha, shubha, shubha Shubhayar. When a person realizes you, he no longer cares about his good and bad fortune arising from past pious and sinful acts, since you, it is you alone who control this good and bad fortune. Not clear enough for you? Still a little hmm, vague? Okay, how about this from Padma Purana? Nakarma Bandhanam Janma Vaishnavanam Shavityate. The Vaishnavas do not have rebirth caused by karma. The Vaishnavas take another birth. It's to do more bhakti. It's to do more sadhana. Or to do more bhakti by bringing bhakti to other people. And then he says, remembering from previous practice alone the mental embrace, upaguhanam, of the Lord's lotus feet, he has no desire to give that up. And he says, the verse doesn't say remembering his lotus feet, but rather remembering the embrace of his lotus feet. In other words, service to his lotus feet. The implication of these two words is that even though he may give up by his own choice the worship once, twice, or three times because of poor determination, after some time, by remembering his previous state of bliss, from remembering the Lord, and also remembering his, pre his present state of distress, from not remembering the Lord, he repents. Oh, oh, what have I foolishly done? Let that be. I will not again abandon the worship of the Lord, and he again begins worshiping the Lord. The verse also uses the phrase, does not desire to give up, instead of does not give up. This implies that he desires that he be devoid of pride in his practice. He desires to be devoid of pride in his practice. The accomplishment is in the hands of the Lord. In other words, this isn't me. Whatever progress I make, that's the Lord's mercy. That's Krishna's mercy. Bhakti Devi. She's Krishna's Kripa Shakti. And those devotees who are giving their mercy to me, they're her agents. Badge carrying, you know, badge 108, right? And he says, the cause of not desiring to give them up is then mentioned. Okay. Now it's time to fasten your seat belts. And I'm not kidding because this is where we step on the gas. The cause of not desiring to give up, <coughs> giving up to give up is then mentioned. Rasagraha, 
Prabhupada uh, defined it as one who remembers that taste. Here Vishwanath Chakravarti calls it, uh, says it means one who is eager for tasting or make sure that your belt, seat belts are securely fastened, low. Everybody's belted in. One who is eager for tasting or one who has a taste for something like a ghost which, which cannot be given up. Haunted by rasa. Can I read that again? Rasagraha means one who is eager for tasting or one who has a taste for something uh, one who has a taste which is something like a ghost which cannot be given up, haunted by rasa. You can't give it up. Bhakti makes us see the Lord. Bhakti brings us into the presence of the Lord. Bhakti controls the Lord. Oh, but well, we'll see. Um, bhakti is the most powerful thing of all. If you've had a taste, you can't give it up. You will, we will be haunted by that, period. Now, we can cover that memory up by offenses, maybe. But that's, an, that's, a, whole different, that's a whole different set of seminars. <clears throat> haunted by Russia. Okay, then you're thinking, okay, hot by Russia. That, we're talking back to the high bar, right? So you may be thinking that the meaning is then that worship is that worship after the stages of Nishta, Ruchi, and Asakti becomes actual Russia at the stage of Rati. Makes sense. However, Feet, seat belts are fastened tight and low. <laughs> Harness, okay. Just wanna make sure. However, even from the first day of worshiping the Lord, there is certainly a portion of tasting rasa, even if in a very covered form. Want me to read that again? Yes. Can you handle it? Can you handle the truth? <laughs> However, even from the first day of worshiping the Lord, there is certainly a portion of tasting rasa in a very covered form. Can you imagine? I mean, I read that and I just thought, holy cow. Even from the first day. And I went back to 1969. I went back to 1968, maybe, listening to the Hare Krishna mantra on KPOI FM radio listening to the hair soundtrack. And then when I met the devotees, when I actually chanted with real devotees at a Jimi Hendrix concert under the full moon on a spring night in Hawaii, with thousands of other people, it just complete, I mean, it didn't make the same impression we were asking last night. Okay, we're talking about why some people seem to be able to receive the mercy and some people aren't because we have different backgrounds. Not everybody was affected the same way I was. One other person was that I know, my friend Kusha Devi, my dear God sister Kusha Devi. She and I ended up actually a few months later moving into the temple on the same day. We met the devotees on the same night, chanted with the devotees for the first time on the same night in May of 1969 at, uh, at that Jimi Hendrix concert and we moved into the temple on the same day. We didn't know each other until that day when we moved into the temple. Um, and we've been friends ever since. She's like my little sister. Um, there are a couple of people who for... It's been five na years now since I took sannyas. Uh, today's Thursday, Tuesday, I think, was, the 8th was the 10th, 5th anniversary. 
by the calendar. It was Janmashtami, so I'm waiting until Janmashtami before I actually uh, observe it. But um, that was the calendar, fifth anniversary. And for years, a couple of years, there are a couple of people, Kusha and Govinda Dasi, who kept calling me uh, Babru Maharaj. <laughs> so I can't help it. Uh, and I said, you and Govinda Dasi, you can get away with it. Because you've known me since 1969. And I, from you, I take it as a, a, a sign of affection. Some other people, not so much. But, um, from, you know, from you. So, so it didn't affect everybody the same way. It certainly didn't affect the friends that I went to the concert with the same way. I don't remember whether they even chanted, whether they were part of the chanting and dancing. I was. Um, and I was probably the most restrained, the, sh the shyest, most introverted of that whole group of friends. But I couldn't not chant. As soon as I heard the chanting, I just thought, oh yes, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is where I belong. <laughs> And that some people told Kusha, because Kusha wore a saffron-colored sari to that concert for some reason. She was like 17 years old. She was still in high school and uh, just about to graduate from high school. And she was wearing the saffron-colored sari, and people told her, oh, your people are over there. <laughs> Pointed her over to the devotees. Um, and when I ended up moving into the temple a few months later, all my friends were like tugging at me, They're like, no, no, you can't abandon us. You can't reject us for them. Those weird. So not everybody was affected the same way because there was some background of having performed some bhakti before. And when Kusha and I came, came in contact with the devotees, bang, that was it, it was over. Um, there was a little winding down maybe that had to take place over the next whatever, whatever it was, five, six, seven months. And then bang, we were in the temple full time. So from the very, so there I, I, I was, it was, that's why I say I heard the devotees chanting, my life was finished then. It was, that was it. Um, Thus it is said, now again, he's making a really bold statement. From the very first day of worshiping the Lord, there is certainly a portion of tasting rasa. So this is, you're talking to me not just after nishta, ruchi, and asakti? Whoa. So he says, okay, I understand this is a very bold statement, so I need to back it up with Shastra. So he goes to the 11th canto, second chapter of the 11th canto, another one of my favorite verses. Bhakti pareshana bhavo virakti ran yatra chai shatri eka kalaha prapatya manasi yatashna tastyus tushti pushti kshuda bhayo nukhas. This is the sage Kavi speaking to King, um, what was the king? Oh, anyway, uh, this is the before the Uddhava Gita portion, which is the main part of the eleventh canto. He ha he asked, uh, yeah, yeah. was it Yayati? Yayati, he was speaking with Avadutta right on the beginning of the heart. But this is the sage. He spoke with the. I mean, this is the king. He spoke with the Navyogendras. His name escapes me for some reason. I don't think it's Yayati. Anyway, the uh, clock is ticking, so I have to. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this um, king from, anyway, he, uh, he asked nine questions of the, of the Navyogendras, who were sons, as I mentioned last year, sons of King Rishabdev. King Rishabdev had a um, uh, hundred sons. Um, they weren't all Kshatriyas. Uh, nine of them were uh, these great sages. Um, 
So um, the, the verse translates like this. Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord and detachment from other things. Bhakti parishano bhavo viraktira mitra. So devotion, parishano bhavo, uh, uh, direct experience of the Lord and viraktira mitra. Uh, 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 detachment from other things. These three occur simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of Krishna. In the same way, pleasure, fullness of the stomach, and relief from hunger are experienced simultaneously with each bite for a person engaged in eating. So this is, the, this is an answer to, how do you know if you're making any progress in devotional service? We heard this question the other night in Prague. And we heard this answer. He didn't cite the verse, but he, and he didn't give the example that's given in the verse. But he covered these, you know, Guru Maharaj covered these three things very nicely. I was waiting for the verse. I was sitting there, yeah, 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 bhakti prasha anubhava viraktena nyatra. And he didn't. But he did talk about watching out for an increase in devotion, some experience of the Lord, and detachment of other things. If you listen to that class, it's very wonderful how he does it. Um, he actually explains this verse as Srila Prabhupada told us so many times in his own words. He was amazing. I was sitting there reading, yeah, that was great. And I told him afterwards. I don't, as I, I've told devotees sometimes, I'm not much of a gusher. Um, but occasionally I do gush at, when I'm really impressed. And, and I just told him afterwards, I said, you know, I was waiting for Bhakti Pareshan and Bhava, and he says, well, that would have been a good verse to cite. And I said, yeah, but the thing is, you did explain that verse. You, got, you covered all three of those things. And he says, yeah, I did. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, as Prabhupada said so many times, in your own words. And he says, well, that's pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> it was excellent. Um, so I read that and I thought, and, I, and, you know, and then I thought, okay, wait a minute. We know, especially after hearing from uh, uh, Swami Tripurari, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is a little enthusiastic. He's very liberal in his approach to bhakti. I mean, he's re he gets really excited about the power of bhakti. And so maybe if I get too crazy about this idea. From the very first day of practice, from the very first day of engaging in any kind of bhakti, from the very first day of chanting, you're tasting some kind of rasa, even if in a covered form, even if, uh, I made some notes, even if uh, in Kuwait it's not completely, you're not really getting, you know, you don't really get what's going on. Um, Maybe that's a little crazy to start sharing with people. So I thought, hmm, so what does Jiva Goswami say about this verse? So the first place I found was, um, now, Vishwanath Chakravarti also makes a commentary on this verse that I hope I remember to come back to. Um, but the, uh, the first place I found, first place I thought to look for Jiva Goswami's um, take on this Bhakti Pareshana Pavo verse um, was his commentary on where the verse comes up in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And that is um, at the beginning of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu when Rupa Goswami is uh, describing the six characteristics of pure devotional service. And one of them is Sri Krishna Karshan. And if we study uh, nectar devotion or bhakti rasamrita sindhu, we know that the first two um, arise in sadhana bhakti, the second two arise in bhava bhakti, and the, the, set, the, the last two the, of the six arise in prema bhakti. And one of the last two is Sri Krishna Karshan, the last, I think it's the last one listed, which means uh, pure bhakti has the power to attract even Krishna. So. Um, so I, I went there. So this is in the first chapter of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, which talks about bhakti um, in a general way. 
And Rupa Goswami says, uh, Shri Krishna Karshani Hitva Haring Prema Bhajam Priya Varga Samadvitam Bhaktir uh, Vasi Karoti Iti Shri Krishna Karshani Matha Bhakti attracts Shri Krishna and his associates. Bhakti is called Shri Krishna Karshani because it makes the Lord addicted to Prema. Whoa! <laughs> it makes the Lord addicted to Prema. We hear that, right? Krishna is Brahman. Krishna is Bhagavan when he's under the control of Bhakti, when he's under the control of Prema. Bhakti is the most powerful thing. Bhakti controls Krishna. But we're talking about Prema Bhakti, I guess, because we're talking about Sri Krishna Karshani, which is a characteristic of Bhakti that arises from uh, in the stage of Prema Bhakti. And Jiva Goswami um, will confirm that as we go through here. Uh, because Prema is attractive to him, Akarshana, he's called Prema Pajam, addicted to Prema in his, the Prema in his devotees. The word Sri in Sri Krishna Karshani indicates Priyavarga Samanvitam, along with his dear associates. So Krishna is attracted along with his dear associates to Bhakti. To, to Bhakti. And then he cites um, a, verse, uh, a verse from the 14th chapter. So here, now we're getting somewhere. He says, Na sadhayate maam yogo na samkim dharma uddhava na svatyayas tapa tyago yata bhakti mamorjita. My dear Uddhava, unalloyed devotional service to me, uh, rendered to me by my devotees, brings me under their control. I cannot be thus controlled by those engaged in mystic yoga, Sankhya philosophy, pious work, Vedic study, austerity, or renunciation. Oops, I think I skipped. None of these things can control me to the extent that um, pure devotional service can. And Jiva Goswami comments, though one may conclude that the bhakti mentioned here is sadhana, by comparing it with other processes such as Sankhya, it cannot be an example of sadhana that brings Krishna under control because of the statement in verse 40, 41 that Krishna is brought under control only by sadhya bhakti. Thus the meaning of bhakti after producing sadhya, thus the, the, the meaning is bhakti after producing sadhya bhakti, prema, controls me. Oh, there's the wet blanket. And I thought, oh no. Okay, there's my idea. So, okay. So Jiva Goswami is certainly more um, conservative than Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, and here's the evidence. So maybe my case is not so strong. But then, I started looking through Jiva Goswami's Bhakti Sandarbha, where he discusses the characteristics of bhakti from many different angles. And then I found this um, kind of late in Bhakti Sandarbha. There's a section um, called uh, that, that, that can be called Krishna uh, that bhakti bestows inconceivable results and section 147 even sadhana bhakti captivates the Lord oh. <laughs> I said all right now we're cooking <laughs> boys and girls we're in town you know okay so this is Jiva Goswami commenting on this and he goes back, he even goes back to this verse from the 14th chapter from the Uttava Gita, where he said, oh, we're talking about Prema Bhakti, and looks at it, looks at this whole section of verses very carefully, and gives us hope. Are we doing okay? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, because I just, I don't want to get into trouble. I don't, this is, um, to be honest, this is my next article. This isn't even the article I'm working on right now. I have to get the article I'm working on right now done. It's about something in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, another article about the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita. 
um, I gotta get it done, and it's been giving me some trouble, but I gotta get it done because I wanna get to this. I wanna bring all this together. I wanna, you know, get in there and start hammering things together. Get my hands dirty and get some scratches and blisters and things and pull this thing together because it's just so much fun. Um, Dhruva's life is the proof that bhakti re bestows results far exceeding anything a devotee could conceive within the mind because Lord Dhruva, the Lord offered Dhruva his own planet along with supreme devotion. And why Dhruva? Why is that a big deal? Because Dhruva's devotion wasn't even unmotivated, right? Dhruva wanted something. He wanted something more than you and I want. He wanted a kingdom bigger than his great-grandfather's. And who's his great-grandfather? Brahma. That's a pretty big thing to want. And he was upset. I mean, he was a five-year-old Chaturya kid, completely hacked off because his stepmother, wicked stepmother, <laughs> who actually was one of his gurus because she put, set him in the right direction inadvertently, told him, and even though he's the firstborn son, ordinarily the heir, your father likes me more than any of his other wives, and he doesn't even consider you his son. So you want to play on your father's lap. That's not going to happen in this lifetime. The only way it'll happen is if you were to die and take birth from my womb. And that freaked him out so much, he went home completely in tears. Those of us who are parents, you know, we, we've seen our kids com become completely hysterical, completely overwhelmed, you know, get, uh, crying. Uh, and they lose control of their breath and, and they can't control it. It's just spirals out of control. We try to calm them down. They can't, you know, we, we're sitting there holding them, patting their backs, rubbing their backs for maybe half an hour. And they're just like, <laughs> they can't, you know. This is a five year old Chaturya kid. He's so angry and, and um, his feelings are hurt so badly. And he's like, <laughs> And so he asked his mother, so what is the deal? How, can I, how do I get this straightened out? And she says, your father doesn't care about me so much. I have nothing I can do. Listen, um, sweetie, nobody will be able to help you with this except the Lord. Cool. Where do I find him? <laughs> well, I don't know about this kind of stuff. I grew up a princess. Never really been outside, the, and I'm a queen now, and I've never really been outside the palace. But I hear the great sages go to the forest to find the Lord. Boom! This kid's out the door. Didn't even, didn't look back. Didn't think twice, didn't look back. Um, the, he, Narada Muni, you know, he encountered Narada Muni by the will of the Lord. Narada Muni gave him instruction in bhakti yoga with a little emphasis on the, a lot of emphasis on the bhakti part. And uh, Dhruva got direct darshan of the Lord. And he realized, who? what did he say in the, in the Bhagavatam? He said, uh, I'm like a poor man who, when he encounters the king, when he comes before the king, he could ask for anything. He could have half his kingdom, but ask for a bag of rice. In other words, I wasn't too bright, was I? And in another Shastra that Prabhupada loved to quote, I can't remember the Shastra, and the, I, used to, I used to have this verse memorized, but it's back there somewhere in the fog. Um, but he said, I, I was uh, looking for pieces of broken glass, and now I found the most valuable jewel. Um, so, um, so, he, Jiva Goswami excites, cites the example of Dhruva, who wasn't even an unmotivated devotee. He was kind of an accidental devotee, right? His mother said, well, it's only the, the Supreme Lord who's going to be able to straighten your problem out for you. This is a big one. Um, so he said, okay, 
got to go find the Lord. So um, then Jiva Goswami, after a couple of other things, Jiva Goswami brings us to this 14th chapter. And he says, uh, a point to be considered here is that the statement which appears in the 14th chapter, this is uh, the Nasat Hayate, no, uh, this is uh, um, the 21st verse of the 14th. Bhakti Hamikaya Grahya Shraddhayatma Priyasatam Bhakti Punati Manishta Sopaka Apisambhavat. Only by practicing unalloyed devotional service with full faith in me can one obtain me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I'm naturally dear to my devotees who take me as their only goal of their the only goal of their loving service. By engaging in such pure devotional service, even the dog eaters can purify themselves from the contamination of, the, of their low birth. In this culture, the station of your birth was a kind of an important thing, and it was a reflection um, of your past deeds, your past activities. So you take. Um, birth in a, in a, in a family of, of dog eaters. In other words, people who were completely indiscriminate about what they ate. Prabhupada sometimes explained that uh, you could judge a man's station in life by how he, he or, she, or a person's station in life by how they get their food. Um, dog eaters, very low. Nobody wanted to be around them. Completely untouchable outcast kind of person. But bhakti is so powerful that they can purify even that person's consciousness. So he says that um, uh, this statement is a description of the glories of bhakti without specifying whether the bhakti being referred to is that of the practicing stage or the perfectional stage, sadhana or sadhya. Sadhana is the practicing stage, sadhya is the perfectional stage. It means you, when you've accomplished what bhakti is all about. So for sadhana bhakti, the sadhya, the immediate sadhya is bhava bhakti, and for those in bhava bhakti, their sadhya is uh, prema bhakti. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu says, well, there's two stages of bhakti. There's sadhana bhakti and sadhya bhakti. But sadhya, sadhana bhakti, you, sadhya bhakti could be bhava bhakti or prema bhakti. Therefore, he says, it's difficult to establish from this verse that it's the greatness of bhakti in the practicing, sta practicing stage that is referred to. Yet, even if the verse is describing the glories of bhakti in the perfectional stage, the practice stage is thereby glorified because it's only through practice that perfection comes about. So he starts by saying, okay, maybe we can't really clearly make the point that, uh, make a case that we're talking about sadhana bhakti. So indirectly it's glorifying sadhana bhakti because you don't get sadhya bhakti, you don't get prema bhakti without sadhana bhakti. And uh, I'm just going to skip some stuff because uh, I have uh, many pages of notes here. Um, so then he, uh, I'm just going to skip to this stuff from the 14th chapter because this is where it kind of gets interesting. He makes a, um, Jiva Goswami makes a, a very thorough examination of these verses, 18, 19, uh, 20, 21, and 22, actually the verses I was talking about last year from a kind of a different perspective. Um, he says they, they all lead up to... These verses lead up to verse 23, which says, If one's hairs do not stand on end, how can the heart melt? If the heart doesn't melt, how can tears of love flow from the eyes? If one doesn't cry in spiritual happiness, how can one render loving service to the Lord? Without such service, how can consciousness be purified? So it sounds here as though we're talking about a very high 
standard of service. And then he cites the next verse after that. He says, Vagadgada dravate yasya chittam rudatya bhikshyam abhikshnam hasati kvachitcha vilajja udgayati vittyate chanam madbhakti yukto uvanam punati. A devotee whose speech is sometimes choked up, whose hearts melts, who cries continually and sometimes laughs, who feels ashamed and cries out loudly and then dances, a devotee thus fixed in loving service to me purifies the entire universe. And he says, so the implication of this statement is, is that if Sadhya Bhakti purifies the whole world, what the speaker purifies the desires for enjoyment that remain in the heart of the practicing devotee, and then he says there's a whole logic that you can apply to, to um, say that, uh, to show how that um, the power of Satya Bhakti can remove the subtle inclinations for, for enjoyment even in the sadhaka. So it's a whole thing, you know, it's a whole thing. So we go back um, to verse 18. He says, so let's take a look at verse 18. He says, verse 18 is about sadhana bhakti because nama pas is famous for uprooting all sins. Says, it's, the verse says, yatagnis tu samadharchi karote dhangshi pasmasat tata madvishaya bhaktir udhavainangshi kritsnasa. Just as a blazing fire burns a pile of firewood to ashes, Devotion directed to me, O Uddhava, destroys all sins. And then he says, after this, the next one and a half verses also describe sadhana bhakti. Oh, that's verse 19. So we already saw verse 18 is about sadhana bhakti. So this kind of sounds like sadhya bhakti here. Um, but then he says it's about sadhana bhakti because he says even namabhas, even the shadow, the reflection of the holy name is famous for uprooting all sins. So he says, well, this doesn't have to be sadhya bhakti. This doesn't have to be perfected bhakti, prema bhakti, to destroy all sins. So he says, okay, we're still talking about sadhana bhakti here. And then he says, okay, the next verse and a half. Um, so he says, verse, first in verse 20, by Krishna's stating that he can be captivated only by devotion and not yoga, sankhya, and other methods, bhakti is contrasted with other methods of sadhana. Now, in his commentary in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, he said that's not the case. But in Bhakti Sindarbha, he says it is the case. Because he's talking about other methods of sadhana, because he's comparing bhakti here to other methods of sadhana, we may assume that he's also talking about sadhana bhakti that has this power, that has this great power. Since different methods of practice can be contrasted only with something else that is also, oh, please don't tell me that my, okay, that is also a practice, the bhakti being referred to here can only be sadhana, not sadhya. It can only be bhakti in practice, not bhakti in perfection. In addition, he says, the first half of verse 21, Krishna states that he can be attained only by devotion endowed with faith. The understanding is that satya bhakti is, a, is, on, is attained only by performing sadhana bhakti with faith. So if this verse were referring to sadhana bhakti, the mention of faith would be redundant here. You only need to talk about Bhakti with faith if you're talking about sadhana bhakti. Because the faith is already inherent in sadhya bhakti. You understand? You follow? Mm -hmm. You see how I was, you can, can you imagine how I was, I was get, getting excited, I was like squirming in my chair as I was reading this thing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, this is, this is where I'm thinking, okay. I'm writing an article. <laughs> I'm writing an article. People are, you know, some people are going to think I'm a little um, presumptuous, but uh, that's tough. I'm generally reserved in my nature. I'm by nature introverted and quite shy, but I am not timid. 
I am not timid. So, where did it go? Okay. So then he says, although the Lord is controlled only by sadhya bhakti, we've shown that this entire section deals primarily with sadhana bhakti. Therefore, the characteristic of bhakti to control the Lord is spoken of here, that is spoken of here in reference to is, that is, therefore, the characteristic of bhakti to control the Lord is spoken of here in reference to sadhana bhakti. So if we go back, so there's, there's a lot more. He, he, he goes on, he, he talks about, um, uh, he talks about uh, the Apichet Sudura, Suduracharo verse, uh, verse uh, 30 in the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Even if someone engages in the most abominable acts, if he's engaged in Ananya Bhakti, which means he doesn't have any other worshipable Lord than Krishna. You don't have to be perfect. It's just you don't have faith in anybody other than Krishna. You don't have faith in material life. You don't have faith in yoga to bring about perfection in your life. You don't have faith in um, monistic perfection or anything like that. You have faith in Krishna. Okay, you can't follow through on everything. You're not perfect in your practice. You get distracted, you fall down sometimes. Maybe you even do horrible things because you've, the scars haven't been completely uprooted yet. But still, Krishna says, he's to be considered saintly. And I can remember it was somebody's tikka, maybe Vishwanath or maybe Baladev, and, you know, and he says, why is it to be considered saintly? Because I say so. Because I consider him saintly. Because he loves me. Okay, yeah. He's still a little screwed up, yeah. But he loves me. So he's fine with me. We saw yesterday evening about uh, how it's how Krishna's partiality toward his devotees is actually an ornament. It's not really a fault. Who's going to fault? Okay, so the devotee is supposed to be uh, have equanimity. They want to be merciful. They want to be kind to everybody. See everybody the same. So, you know, we expect car and treat everybody fairly, but if something happens, somebody threatens Neela, watch out. Oh, watch out. Right? Mother bear. <laughs> Do not get near Namrasana if something is threatened. I mean, you don't want to be in the path if something happens to Neela, you know, or, or, or Radic. Or something were to happen to Karma. You know, you're just like, oh no. It's natural. Nobody's going to say, oh, she's not as worried about Prem Arnav as she is about Neela. No, that's Nityangi's business. <laughs> she's partial to Prem Arnav. So, and that's natural. That's, so when Krishna is partial to his devotees, I mean, he tells Arjuna over and over again in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, all right, so we got all these other things going on, but here's the thing, you, got, you, have, you, I, you really, I love you. I just want you to love me. I love you. Over and over and over, and he comes to the end, and he says, just love me, because I love you. And here's how you do it. Forget everybody else. Right? Sarvadharman paritya jamami kamsharam virja. And here we are in the Pagutam, which brings, you know, which, be, which begins with, okay, dharma prochi to kaita vaktra paramo nirmatsaranam satam. This is for people whose hearts are completely pure because they don't have any envy, because they don't have any material ambitions at all. Why? Because they've given up all kinds of cheating, even cheating religion. Dharma artha, pro, uh, dharma artha kama moksha vancha. All desires for anything material including dharma. I mean, that's a shocking statement. You read that, especially when you read it the way Krishnadas Kaviraj says it in Chaitanya Charitamrita. What do I mean when I, but when, what do we mean when we talk about cheating religion? Dharma, I mean, dharma, artha, kama, moksha, bunch of dharma? Yeah, because Krishna said, sarva dharma, give them all up, not some of them. Give them all up. 
It's all about me. That's that bumper sticker on the back of Krishna's chariot. It says, yeah, it's all about me. Just love me. So, with all that in mind, I want to go back to the Bhakti Pareshana Pavo verse. Because I, because I was thinking, okay, so Vishwana Chakavarti Thakur ends his commentary on this verse in the fifth chapter of the first canto with the Bhakti Pareshana Pavo verse. And he says, this tells us that um, even for, this is our this is evident this is his evidence for his assertion his bold assertion wild assertion that even from the first day of worshiping the Lord there is certainly a portion of tasting rasa even if it's in a very covered way. So then I thought, okay, what does he say in his commentary on that verse? What is I mean? How does that verse tell us? from the very first day of serving the Lord. So here's his commentary on that verse. Again, the verse is, devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord and detachment from other things. These occur simultaneously for one who's taken shelter of Krishna in the same way that pleasure, fullness of the stomach and relief from hunger are experienced simultaneously with each bite. With each bite for a person engaged in eating. With each bite, it starts with the first bite. With the first bite, you get some um, uh, pleasure, right? Sit down with that bowl of halava. There's pleasure with the first bite. There's some satisfaction with the first bite and some uh, mitigation of your hunger, some slaking of your hunger, starting from the first bite. And if you keep going, if it's a big enough bowl, after a while, you get like, oh, I'm never going to eat again, right? Anybody ever said that? More than five times, I'm never going to eat again. Wow, you guys are a lot more self-controlled than I am. I've been saying that since 1970. When we were brahmacharis, oh my God, we used to eat so much prasadam. And especially at the Sunday feasts, we were so poor, we didn't spend money on food except for the Sunday feasts. And we went nuts. <laughs> the guests must have thought, God, oh, these guys are crazy. <laughs> so he explains. So anyway, so then he explains. An example is given to show that even at the stage of sadhana, which gives great happiness, one achieves the result. When there is bhakti in the form of hearing and chanting about Krishna, the supreme deity, there should be a sweet experience. And at that time, there should also be an experience of detachment from material happiness. These three should arise at the same time. Tri ekakala, right? That's what the verse says, at the same time. Just as the experience of pleasure, satisfaction, and fullness, or pleasure, fullness, and, and uh, 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 losing your hunger, losing your, your appetite, being uh, uh, satisfied, um, all happen at the same time, progressively, as we'll see here, as you eat, starting with the first bite. These three should arise at the same time for a person who worships Krishna. Similarly, for a person who eats, there's happiness, nourishment, and disappearance of hunger with each mouthful. As one takes a mouthful of rice, this, oh, he's more austere than I am. As one takes a mouthful of rice, this happens. Just as a person who eats a little gets a little satisfaction, a little nourishment, and a little relief from hunger, so a person who worships the Lord a little with hearing and chanting gets a little experience of the Lord and a little detachment from material life. And just as a person who eats a lot gets full satisfaction, full nourishment, and full relief from hunger, so a person who worships the Lord fully experiences the Lord fully and becomes completely detached from material life. But, though it's impossible to keep eating, the more worship, by more worship of the Lord, one becomes more capable of worshiping. That's the difference. So that's his evidence 
And I, saw, I took this as his evidence that beginning from the very first day of worshiping the Lord, from the very first day of chanting, chanting in here, and he uses specifically the examples of hearing and chanting in his, in his uh, commentary on this verse. From the very first day of chanting and hearing, we do get a taste. We do get a little rasa. So we come back. That's why we come back. We got a little taste. And you want some more. And you come back again. Because you got a little bit, a little more taste. And you want even more. And then t until you stop going away. Right? So, what is our situation? We're very fortunate. Why are we fortunate? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are haunted by Rasa. There's no way around it. You, 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 even I. <laughs> we are haunted by Rasa. Otherwise, how is it we're here? Why aren't we somewhere else? Why am I, even well, almost 70, why am I not on the North Shore of Oahu or in Bali or someplace surfing? <laughs> it's summer, after all. College professors, we don't have to, you know, we didn't have to work in the summer. That was a good thing, you know, we got that, that paycheck wasn't great, especially if you teach in public colleges and universities like I did. Not a great paycheck, but it was for nine, we knew that, it was for nine months. Sometimes we'd, we'd say, you know, like we'd meet, we'd meet each other and we'd be talking in October. And I had one friend at, at uh, Hawaii Community College, Lou Zitnick, and he would say, yeah, it's all about May. <laughs> it's all about May. Oh, what are you doing? You know, we'd have a, a big meeting We'd have a big meeting at the end of the spring semester in May, and you know, and everybody's like, "Well, I'm going to the, you know, my wife and I are going to travel around Europe all summer. You know, we're not even going to be in the U.S. for three months, you know, and stuff like that. I'd be working on my house, but um, and chanting and, and writing and stuff. But uh, um, and I have to admit, having been taken in by that jerk, Lark, Lance Armstrong's whole thing. Um, in the middle of the summer, I would stop and watch the Tour de France because I just thought, this is an amazing story, this cancer survivor winning seven tours in a row. And it turns out he's a big cheater and I felt like such a fool. But that was a part of my, that was just a little part of my summer, a few days in the summer, especially toward the end of the tour, you know, when they'd get close to, um, close to Paris, then I, you know, I'd get excited. And then, when they found out he was the guy was just a cheater, I just thought, I'll never watch TV again. <laughs> yeah, I, was such, I felt so foolish being taken in by that. So, oh, there we go. A little confessional for me. My confessional is not like Bhaktivino Thakur's or Krishna Das Gaviraj's. I have a little of that, a little taste um, over the last 48 years. But, um, but that's our, this is our problem. This is why we keep coming together like this. Because we are haunted by rasa. We want to say, oh no, not me. I haven't tasted any rasa. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur begs to differ. And Srila Jiva Goswami, at least in Bhakti Sandarbha, agrees. We are done. We are toast. We're in the oven, stick a fork in us to see when we're done, that's all. It's just waiting for it, we're just waiting to, to be done. But we are, for all practical purposes, cooked. And we see when we, you know, when we try to do the other things unconnected to bhakti, they become frustrating. They're not, you know, they're not fun. When we can connect them to bhakti, then they become very satisfying. Even, you know, even our work, even our jobs, 
we can connect them to bhakti then um, it's kind of fun. I used to do this, uh, I used to try to sneak things into my teaching. At the end of the semester I would bring um, prasadam. Um, at the end of the fall semester, end of the, at the end of the fall semester I would bring bhach. Because at Christmas time, that's a kind of a, that's a Christmas thing, at least in the U.S., chocolate fudge. And uh, end of the spring semester, I would bring chocolate chip cookies. And they would, I would, I would make a lot. And I would offer a big plate in the morning, all of it, to my Takrajis when I did my puja in the morning. So everyone got maha prasada. It wasn't that one or two of my students got Mahaprasada, but everyone who took something it was all Mahaprasada. I got the tulsi leaves, but all the fudge, all the cookies were Mahaprasada. Because they would, nobody would think that was, they would all think that was really weird. Of course, sometimes, especially in Hawaii, they would ask me, Is there anything green <laughs> in, this, in these cookies? <laughs> And I'd say, no, but there's something better. There's love <laughs> in those cookies. Um, oh, I had a student, uh, I had several students, especially in Hawaii, I had several students who were devotees or children of devotees that I knew. One, one woman in one of my classes in, in Hilo, had, she had been, the, for several years, had been the girlfriend of one of my original Gurukula students in Hawaii, a young man named Subal. Um, they were no longer together, but they were still friends. And she was enrolled in one of my classes. So here at the, at the end of the spring semester, I brought out the containers full of chocolate chip cookies and passed them around. And people, I guess, generally think of cookies as having eggs. So this young woman, Laurie, came up to me and she whispered, uh, Mr. Reed, uh, Bob Roo, um, I didn't eat eggs. And I said, um, Lori, neither do I, and, and neither do my deities. This is all a prasada. It's a maha prasada. Go for it. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was so cute. She was like, she wanted to let me know, I'm really trying hard to be a really good devotee. You know? <laughs> you know, I know I live outside, not, you know, and all that, but I'm trying really hard to be a really good devotee. And I said, I said it's cool. This is for you. Um, that way. So, and, and I would also like uh, every once in a while I would find ways to, you know, to bring a little Krishna consciousness. I would talk about non-discrimination um, at the beginning of the semester, and I would say uh, I would try to make the classroom a safe place for everyone, regardless of their race, religion, sexual orientation, or whatever. And I say I would say, well, you know, you can usually tell, you know who in the class is black or white uh, or brown, who's, maybe you can tell who's Christian or who's Jewish or who's Muslim, um, maybe who's Hindu. Says, but th there are things you, I mean, listen, we might even, there might even be a, a Hare Krishna in this room. You don't know, you know, you don't know. <laughs> Just, you have to make this, we want to make our, this space a place where everyone feels comfortable to share their ideas. And by goodness, there was a Hare Krishna in the room every time. And most people didn't know it, although every once in a while there'd be students who'd come up and say, I, I, I had one student come up, she was a friend of the daughter of Badr, now Badri Narayan Goswami, one of the leaders in, in ISKCON. And uh, Anasuya is his daughter, and Anas, she, was a, she was a good friend of my daughter's as well. And this one young woman came up to me, and she, she well, while I was talking to some devotees after class, and she said, Mr. Reed, are you a Hare Krishna devotee? And I said, why would you say that? And she said, well, it's the beads. And she said, you a Hare Krishna devotee? Do you know Robert, who's in charge of the temple? And I said, how do you know that? How do you know Robert? And she says, his daughter, Anasuya, is my best friend. And I said, oh, Anasuya is one of my best friends, too. And I said, yeah, I'm, you busted me. And I, and I told him who my daughter was. And he says, 
oh, that makes sense. <laughs> now I get it. And then sometimes there would be devotee, folks who would show up at the temple and they would see me at the temple and they'd go, what are you doing here? And I'd say, well, I, I, I've been coming here for years. What are you doing here? <laughs> or one time, uh, one of my god brothers who owned a business um, that employed maybe 30 or 30, 20 or 30 people, every once a year he would, he would bring them all to the Sunday feast. And one time he brought this group of people to the Sunday feast and I was giving the lecture. And one of the people was a young woman who had been one of my students about maybe a year or so before that. And she's sitting and thinking, that was my, he was my English professor. <laughs> and I remembered her, she was this really nice girl. She had a really kind of tough exterior, wore Doc Martens and looked real rebellious, but she was this real sweet girl whose boyfriend was in the Navy and all she could wait, she couldn't wait for him to get, get out of the Navy and come home. She was just this really, really nice girl, Rena something or other. Um, so, you know, we, we, if, we, when, if we can connect even our work to our bhakti somehow, even that becomes fun. Uh, otherwise, it just becomes frustrating. This is crazy. Does anyone have any questions or anything they want to add? Anyone not so exhausted? Karna? Yeah. Manav, you said that the bodies are not under the influence of, of karma, uh, but I spoke with Guru Maharaj and he admitted that Prabhupada karma is not easily removed. And Prabhupada karma means not, all, not only means our physical body, but also our mental body, for which so, so much suffering, suffering comes. So, how it is, uh, how it is related to, to us as uh, sadhakas? Are, are we experiencing this Krausa karma or, or not? It's kind of like a blend. Ja mam pytanie odnośnie Krausa karmy, bo Maharaj powiedział, że wielbiciele nie są pod wpływem karmy. Ale ja z kolei rozmawiałem z Guru Maharajem i on powiedział, że właśnie, że pratkę karmy ciężko, ciężko usunąć, uniknąć. I pratka karma nie oznacza tylko naszego fizycznego ciała, może, że nasze ciało jest produktem pratka karmy, ale również nasze ciało mentalne, przez które doświadczamy tak wiele cierpienia. Więc jak to jest właśnie z tym, co Maharaj powiedział? Um, I think of it um, sort of as a blend. Um, say we have a um, say we have a gray scale, right? And we go from where it's very light to gradually getting dark, or maybe um, you know part of it is dark, you know dark, and it gets lighter, or something like that. It's kind of a blend. And it becomes more spiritual, just like the um, the verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita that uh, Guru Maharaj and I have talked about the last few days. Dikshakali bhakta korya atma samarpana, where Krishna, uh, Lord Chaitanya tells Sanatana Goswami that at the time of initiation, when the devotee engages in self surrender, atma samarpana that Krishna accepts his body as being as good as his own. So, Atma Samarpana, self-surrender, we know is an ongoing and progressive process. It's not that the day I get initiated, I'm automatically completely self-surrendered. I know that I didn't completely surrender. I mean, I felt like I surrendered a lot when I, when I accepted initiation. But a few days later, I realized I still have a ways to go. And, you know, and almost 50 years later, I realized still I have a ways to, there's some distance for me to cover here. So the self-surrender is an ongoing process. It's part of our, um, part of our practice. So 
our body becomes progressive, our body and mind become progressively spiritualized as we surrender, as we um, open ourselves to the influence of the Swarup Shakti. This is how I see it. And how we see what happens to us as karma or as kripa, I think whichever makes us appreciate Krishna's mercy more is going to be the more helpful. So if sometimes we think, oh, I'm suffering this because of my past misdeeds. I'm suffering this because of my, um, because I'm resisting Krishna's Kripa Shakti. Because I'm digging my heels in and holding on to who I thought I was before. I'm so, you know, I, I have to let, if that helps us, that's good. It's not necessarily wrong. But we can also think, oh, this is Krishna helping me let go. Maybe we couldn't find this in my chart, if we were, you know, or my hand, or even my Brigu chart or something like that. And something's happening to me. It's like when I took Sanyasa, I don't, you know, I don't think any astrologer foresaw in my chart that I would take sannyas in my mid-sixties. I don't think it was there. Maybe something was there that, you know, that might turn into that. Um, but, I'm, you know, I'm, just, I'm the kind of person who's pretty comfortable where I was. But that was not Krishna's idea. I was not sure the Prabhupada's idea. If anybody's read what I've written about this, the idea was, okay, that's nice. Now it's time for a new adventure. Now it's time for you to let go of what's comfortable and, and actually start giving. And if sannyas is helpful in, the, in that for you, then that's where you need to go, my friend, my, my dear son. And uh, just as Srila Prabhupada was, said, uh, uh, when he had uh, such encounters with his Guru Maharaj, I was a little horrified. And if anyone has ever heard a recording of the, his talk in 1968 on the occasion of the passing of his godbrother and sannyas guru, Bhakti Pragyan Keshava Maharaj, Prabhupada talked about those encounters, dreams, if you like, with his Guru Maharaj. And he said, oh, I was a little horrified. And I heard it in his voice the first time I heard that talk in 1970. And I thought, he's not kidding. This is not a, he's not making a pretense of being horrified. He sounds like he was a little horrified. More than a little horrified when these happened. And I was also a little horrified. Um, so, Whichever, you know, whichever perspective um, helps us in our, you know, encourages us in our surrender more is, is, I think, is the more useful. But they're both there because we know, you know, that if we, we know that if, for example, that if we don't get proper rest, we don't get proper exercise, this body's going to get sick. That seems like material neglect, right? We don't eat right, the body becomes ill that if we're not careful, we can injure the body. My friend Yoga Maya, recent in, in North Carolina, uh, one of Guru Maharaj's early disciples, uh, recently rolled her car and um, uh, injured herself very badly, including breaking a, a, a vertebra in her neck, which is not fun. She's probably in her late 50s, maybe, maybe she's even 60, I don't know. Um, but um, that takes a while to heal in anyone, but especially when, when we get a little older. Um, that seems like something material. You lose control of your car and it rolls, and like the reaction to some inattention or being forced off the road or something, slip sliding on the slick, you know, that seems like a material thing. And the injuries certainly seem material. 
But we can also take it as Krishna's mercy. Maybe this, you know, this isn't something I could have foreseen necessarily. Um, this is, may not be, in, you may not find this necessarily in my chart. Maybe you do. Maybe you see something like it, and it's not going to be that bad. My friend Govinda Dasi used to say, it, "Closing the account, closing your karmic account out." Karma. I have that uh, Krishna is taking our karma and implying in a particular way to teach us something. But we are not getting the karma as, uh, in an automatic, automatical way as normal karma, but he is using to this our own uh, karmic reaction to teach us something. You know? yeah. So we are getting the, this karma in different way. It's Shobhana karma. Yeah. It's called beautiful karma. May not always feel beautiful. But because, as Srila Prabhupada and Vishwanath Chakravarti point out in their commentaries on that verse, once we, once the Swarup Shakti enters our hearts, then bhakti is inherent in us. And the things that happen to us are controlled directly by the Lord Himself. So, the extent to, what, to which it's karma and the extent to which it's kripa, difficult to sort, karma itself is difficult to sort out. Krishna admits as much in Bhagavad Gita. You can't. The intricacies of karma cannot be understood. But, um, and, and then when you mix in bhakti, who knows? You know, what happens, to, you know, to what extent what happens to us is is kripa, shobhana, karma, and, and what extent it's, you know. So somehow or other, we put, our ha we put ourselves in the hands of the Lord. Just like when I, I, you know, when I bring my shilas here, when I bring my shilas to your home, I put them in, in Namrasana's hands. I told her that. I did puja the first morning, I gave them a bath because they'd been neglected for a couple of days with just the mental puja. Actually, they didn't even get that when I was traveling. I was just like up on the plane all night. But, um, and then, you know, traveling with delay, all the delays and everything, um, I didn't have, I didn't have the attention to sit down in the middle of the Warsaw airport. I'm, I was waiting to see when my flight was going, you know, how long was my flight going to be delayed? I couldn't sit down for 45 minutes and do a mental puja. But I did, a, I did a puja the first morning and then I told her, um, now I'm going to leave them in your capable hands. They're all yours. Because I trust her. And then I bring them here. I did a little puja the first morning. I do my little mental puja upstairs for me. And they're in Nityangi's hands. And, and Mayapur's and the other devotees um, uh, while we're here. And... Uh, then tomorrow I'll give them a little sweet, try to appease them and put them away, put them back to rest for a couple of days while we make our way back to Bhaktivan. Um, so, you know, we put ourselves in the Lord's hands, we put ourselves in, in Bhakti Devi's hands, and to the extent that we do that, we can see it as Kripa. It's all good, Prabhu. It's all good, bro. Anything else? Because it's really late. And this is long even for Swami. <laughs> but I, this, was, this was something I've been, um, I've been waiting to do because I've been thinking about these things and I've been talking about them a little bit with my friends in Kansas. And little notes to, to, to Swami here and there. Um, what do you, you know, and he says, eh, you know, Jiva is a little thing. You know, check what he says in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And I'm like, oh. And then I found that the Bhakti Sindarva, and I got really excited, and I said, ah, I'm right. So, um, and I've talked this a little bit about this with, with devotees uh, in the places I work in the Midwest, and in North Carolina as well, when I visited uh, Saragrahi. But nothing seriously. So this is me kind of like, thinking my way through these ideas. Does this make sense? To me, it creates a, such a picture of Bhakti's power and glory. 
Bhakti has, uh, Bhakti makes us see the Lord. Bhakti puts us in the presence of the Lord. Bhakti overwhelms even the Lord. Bhakti is the most powerful thing. I love that verse. I, I love that. Verse. Whatever the mata or shruti is, I love it. Yankuri, thank you so very much. You're all, and, and thanks again. Thanks again for bringing me in.